So we will review some vector stuff from way before, see if we can apply that as we look at the heat transfer. And today we're going to build off of last week's lab and um, take a look at why points are used and try to get a better feel for heat transfer. Now, this is the fifth time I've done week four of this program. And normally I do some more chemistry here. But a lot of the feedback I get is this is one of the hardest weeks I have because I started introducing different kinds of heat specifically two different kinds of radiation. And so we'll try to spend more time on that. Um, I have a whole bunch of stuff that we can work on over the next couple weeks assignment-wise. And it kind of sucks that you have a lot more to do, but I think it really helps to make it more clear. So either we breeze through it and no one gets it, which we've kind of done before, or hopefully we kind of really nail it down. And, and it's a fire class, and so heat transfer, I think, kind of matters. So um, we're meeting again next week instead of two weeks from now, right? Everyone's good with that schedule? Whoa, okay. Cool. Sure, yeah. um, it's, I got a conference in two weeks. Oh, okay. It's either there or here. So um, I, I set that up so it times well with this. And we looked at that in the start date. So we'll run through this now. We'll do a lab with it. You've got a week to go over everything I hand out. Bring back questions next week. And then you get three weeks to work on it. Does that work? Cool. So let's review. No other questions on final projects, we're all right. No one wants to say anything at least. Cool. Um, we did our quiz. Is there anything from the homework that we should review? Things I have to doubt. I have one that I'll have if no one brings anything up. And if there's something that you kind of suck on or you're not really sure of, I promise you, you're not the only one. Uh, so. The sound is okay, but just saying, hey, let's do this. Is oh, let's see. 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 Let's Fuel and oxygen to the heat. Does that work? So I'm going to change a tiny bit from that and just go and create heat to release energy. Um, I'm not, I mean, totally there otherwise, but just for generality, let's like that. Cool. Okay, so what three things do we need to have a plane? Let's go with someone here. Oxygen. Oxygen and fuel and adding ignition or activation. Heat or energy, yeah, John. Cool. Um, in the case of our candle flame, anyone new, what makes up those three components? What's giving us what, Mark? So, so we just found out the three things we need to have the flame that we just defined, and in our candle flame system, where are those three things coming from? So energy is from the lighter, okay. the fuel is from the candle, okay. and then uh, the oxygen is just from Around this. Where's our, how's our fuel getting to that flame from our candle? Uh, the fuel is getting to the flame from the candle. Because it's so, the wax. candle wax is soaked up into the wick, which is. How is it getting soaked up? Because it's, it's or melted. And ah. it's, it's like what? Like action, uh, uh, one time you ever get to use that word, you like the on bio class. Right, right, yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> so, but how, how is capillary action able to act on wax? Only wax just sits there. Why does our candle wax get soaked up and melted? Okay. So, so it's a wick, which is on fire. Okay. So yeah. heat feedback, really hot flame, it melts our wax, that melted wax gets run off, and that gets rid of this flame, and it goes out. General behavior, anything special we should go over there? Experimental observations, what do we what do we get out of half an hour looking at candle flames? It's a laminar and both becomes turbulent. The flame itself is definitely laminar, right? Yeah. And then we also kind of snuck in and took a look at the flow above that and realized it stays laminar for a while, and then pretty much like everything, it goes to turbulent. Anything else? Nothing else? I just switched sides. Like, yeah. Alright, that's it. So, laminar flame and it goes turbulent. There's nothing else that we needed to learn there. Cool. Um, chemistry wise, that was our example of any, any flame reaction that we're looking at. Fuel and oxidizer we need. If it burns to completion, you can see it from the water that releases energy. And most of our fuels, like the wax that we saw burning, was some kind of hydrocarbon. So, 
We also probed our flames in a whole bunch of different ways, and we found out that not just CO2 and water came out. What did we find? So, it's like so. so where was that being formed? I didn't know. In the flame. The so the flame. let's take a look at our flame. What do you mean? Top of the flame. Top of the flame. Top of the flame. Well, inside of the top of the flame. Inside of the top of the flame. Because it was oh. hollow. It was hollow. I remember. So there was nothing inside of there? No, there was nothing. What's inside of that flame? So we're going to poke through a whole bunch of things, and we're going to draw a scalar or vector field as needed to describe what's going on here. Does that work? So I'm going to start with quiet people. Is that cool? We've got like four or five people kind of saying stuff, and then a couple quiet people. And we're going to draw a scalar and or vector fields for the temperature field, heat transfer, velocity, and species distributions in there. So anyone who hasn't done anything yet and wants to claim the easiest one of those wants to give it a try. What is the answer? No takes. All right, let's start with a temperature field. Is that fair? And I'm going to draw a line across here. And I want you to draw a temperature at your, as if you're on any, any point on that line, right? So let's say here, I'm at ambient temperature, not changing, not changing, not changing, and get to the flame. Something's going to happen. It may or may not vary as I'm in there. And then way out here, I go back to the same temperature. So on this axis, I have temperature. Here, it's either going to go up because it's hotter or down because it's colder, but something's going to happen. So can I have a volunteer to follow the path of this line and just plot temperature that you would see along this line? Does that make sense what we're asking for? No? Any questions? I'm getting silent. So what? I don't understand. OK, so this line is plotted against this axis. So let's make this just x and temperature. And so as I move along x on this line, I want to know how hot it is. And so if I'm moving here, pretty much nothing's happening, right? So it's still the same temperature, still the same temperature. Once I get to the flame, something will change, right? And so either this line is going to go up because it gets hotter, or it's going to go down, or it's just going to do this for some reason. But I doubt that, right? So as you walk across this line, I'm asking for a volunteer to say, what should that really look like? Okay. Is that fair? Yeah. Cool. Do you want to get, take us out of it? We said it's a All right. Screws. How far are we saying the line draws? Oh, we're saying it's like that line is down. right where it is. So oh, as you're following along that line, what are okay. we going to see? Yeah. It well, can can we draw? We do uh, uh, contour plots of temperature before. Can it just skip? Okay. No. Okay. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Cool. Well, um, there are subtleties, and we'll we'll get to that. But we're going to keep here now. Uh, right. Stay back, and they'll help you with this one. Now I'm gonna we're gonna plot on the same axis, but we're walking across this part of the flame. Take another stab at it. Does that curve look exactly the same? This one, right? So along here, same temperature, so that would look the same. As you go into the flame region, what would you expect to be different? Does that make sense? All right. So let's draw that one up, and you'll get feedback from everyone who is here to help you. <laughs> we're here to help you, actually. So no, so keep on the same axis just so that we can compare it directly, right? So start right up here, and then imagine you're walking across this line, but still plotting on this. Mm, starting up here, so here's our axis, but this is where we're walking. So I'm going along here, I'm going along here, so I plot my temperature here is the same thing. As I get to the flame, it's going to go up. But I want to compare, is the profile you drew here identical as I walk on this line, or as I walk on this line? Or does this shape kind of change? Is it higher or lower or different? Right. Any, you can sit back. And you can safely sit down. Anything we should change? Are we happy with that? Do we accept why it's different? Are we including it like going through the wick? Um, that's a good question. We should, right? Yeah, so let's do yeah. that for the sake of it. But how would that change things? I felt like it would be hotter in the wick, but like drop down on the other side. So it's like an upside down. Kind of like really, really upside down. Down. I don't know what that looks like. Can you draw that for me? Okay. Wait, isn't it upside down M just as W? Right. Completely different. Otherwise, they would call them that same thing, right? Yeah. No, why so would, so why so would it's an upside down? It would drop down. Yeah, it's it's the the same same looks like a double. It's it's back the same up, back down. Oh, so honestly, I actually did know what you're talking about. Oh. Okay. Oh. 
So are we all okay with that? It might Whoa. Be lower. So why is it dropping down a little bit? I do kind of like that. Because I felt like it was pulling air in like this on through here. Oh, so fresh air. your thought is there's fresh air hanging out right inside here. Do we agree with that? Sure. Sure. When you reached in there and pulled stuff out of there, what were you pulling out, though? No. Nothing? It was a little, it was bit, it was a little bit of snow. Snow. They were vapors in there, right? So there was, it wasn't fresh air, so that's where I'm going with that. Okay. Okay. But where did we have that flame reaction? Was it, if I cut this off, was it flaming constantly across the air? It kind of died down. Right. So what would that look like in temperature? How might that change? Um, that that sure. expression means you, you got it right away. We did cut it off. I can't reach. Ah, that's a shame. I should, oh man, that's a shame. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's fine. I'm keep skip it by then. Uh, right, and we should adjust both of them, Wait, right? Because they're both kind of doing it. So. Again, you're following along here, and it suddenly gets hotter. It's hottest at this point in the center, and then cools down no, towards the edge of the flame. Yeah. Do like three seconds to dry and then go for it. So I like that one more. Can we think about why that might be? Thank you. So why is it getting cooler in the middle but kind of hot towards the edges? Less oxygen. There's less oxygen. Yeah, there's nothing. There's no oxygen. Because right. inside of the flame, the ash that's or the whatever's coming off the wick that's still has to combust, has it combusted? It has. It's not actually burning, right? Yeah. The only place we see that reaction is where the edge. Right on the edge. So surface area. So. You should kind of see spikes right along here. And then it'll, it's kind of terrible. But it should drop down and then spike up again. That doesn't help. Right? But along the same path, that's sound history for us, right? And now let's compare. I'm going to accept this for what we're seeing up here. How would our upside down M change? Or upside down W or M, whichever that was? Does that look the same? I support it. You support it, sure. All right, so do we accept that Jake is correct and we move on from there and it's absolutely perfect? So if we accept that, this is the hottest part. That would mean that this piece of cotton is the hottest part. It's even hotter than any edge of the flame, right? That's what that's, what that's saying, right? Yeah, that is. Do we expect that to be the case? What temperature do we kind of expect that to be? We've had we had a bunch of people coming in today, but so how hot do we think that's going to be? Lower than the flame, sure. So this is a cotton wick that's soaked with molten wax, right? How hot can that molten wax get? Right. So what would that upper bound temperature be then? If there's kind of molten wax hanging up there, qualitatively, maybe not a number, but feeling. Lower than the, um, so I'm going to say it kind of goes down. It probably drops fairly significantly once you're in that wick. Yeah. right? So imagine that was soaked with water, another liquid. Then all that liquid water that's in there could never be hotter than what temperature? 100 degrees. Right? So what are that vapor, vaporization temperature of our fuel is? So let's say about 300 degrees, maybe 400 for about 300 uh, of our wax. That's what that has to drop down to. Is that fair? Throw all of that. Let's do. Uh, I want to see velocity profile somehow. I don't know if I can do that as a scalar field or a vector field. That's up to you. And then we'll do one more thing for such effect. So, if you had to draw what velocity looks like in this whole system, how do we do that? Field? Who wants to jump up and, and draw some things? So, what are we drawing first? 
Are we drawing lines again? Are we drawing vectors? With confidence, whichever way we're going to go. Yeah. What are, what, are we going to, what are we about to draw? So if we're drawing something that... Let's draw a vector. Okay, so let's draw a vector. I drew a vector. Yes, you did. Goody. All right, so now how can we draw velocity vectors to show the flow of this fire? What would those look like? If I want to show how and where things are moving to... Okay, have I done it? No. I've, I've drawn a bunch of vectors, right? <laughs> Is that... What are we seeing? Can we draw it on our plane? Any volunteers to do it? Do you want to volunteer someone? Oh, How about this? Can you volunteer two people? Actually, does anyone still have change on them? I don't know if anyone does that. Do you have, like, anyone have coins? No. So I flip them, we wait, take on man out. I mean, I have a phone that we can download. I was going to say, that's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> Quarter. One single quarter. If we oh get my two God! Quarters, you just to just go. Oh, hold on. I have something. We could use dollar for that. Yes. Well, about one. Oh, commemorative. Commemorative. Okay. That, that, that definitely wow. works. Like, <laughs> if, like you're you're running for a bunch of coin toss for me. <laughs> I have honestly, I have nothing. Uh, what else can we flip that's kind of coin shaped? Eight. Is it going right? Is there anything? We need three though. Oh, we're gonna do three. Uh, because we're doing odd man out on this one. Pencil. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would have been the tip. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the rule is we don't lose right. this one. So we're going to flip quarter. Oh, wait, there's another one. Are you okay with it landing on the floor and all that? The seal on. Mm -hmm. pretty nice. So I, wouldn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. So we're going to flip Ian's quarter, your commemorative something, and this eraser. Yeah? Like and <laughs> we're all going to. So we need all three. We're going to decide. Do you have tails and heads? Is that definitive? There's a bear in writing. <laughs> okay, so which is which? Bear be which is it heads? the bear's heads? This is bears heads. heads. This will be heads or tails. Uh, heads. Tails. 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 So you've gone up already. I don't think you have yet, right? So it's going to be you three. You're each going to flip your coin into a racer, and we know which is heads and tails. Whoever gets the one that doesn't match is going to go up here and draw that. Piece. That just means I'm next after them. Yeah. Yeah. All three. Right. Statistically, at some point, two of you match and one of you is out. Does that work? So just flip it up. Let's go. All flip until. Oh, that's my right. So we got one tails. Tails. Heads. Oh God. Heads. Oh, is that heads? Wherever yours ends up, we go. Heads. So tails. There we go. You guys are safe. One of the two is going next. We're going rock paper scissors. Okay, so vectors for velocity field. All right, so we have one going. <laughs> Every single yeah. part of that flow is all going that direction. Yeah. No, here's how we're gonna no, challenge. So I wanted to draw a vector from any of these positions where okay things so are moving. Nice. Right. Choose your four favorite dots. Four favorite. All right, does that one count? Any anywhere choice. that you see a dot. That's not so that one dot. counts as one. So, I so need three, three more. Uh, and draw where things are moving. Uh, okay. Okay, we got one, two more. I agree. Okay. <laughs> one more. So not into it right now. I mean, you don't have to moan every time. You know. <laughs> 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 I'm just drawing one. Okay. Okay. So, at yeah, this Lee point, he's just dancing. So, a particle from right here I is going to go off too. in that direction? Uh, Somewhere. Yeah. Why do you believe it's going in that direction? So anything that's started here is, is going off to the to the right. Going up. It's going up. North, north, north east. Uh, what force would be pushing it out that way? Uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, so it comes in. So, so do you want to draw that? We've got another dot at the bottom left. Let's draw that current. Cool. And so that's gonna. I'm going to draw this guy. Kind of assume that it's doing the same thing. About the same thing, right? They should be about the same. So, what would kind of push that one off in that direction? Everything's pushing it. The heat. Any suggestions? Is that okay? Are we all okay with that one? Is that good? No. I'm okay with that. Okay with All right. So let's have either Mosin or Hunter. How can we? You're both ready to go. Either one. Oh. Okay. Oh. Starting change. I like it. 
I was the key to getting the yes. answer, so you guys are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Let's adjust anything you don't agree with. Uh, just velocity profile, any of those points, whatever might happen to be there, draw where it's going. And so adjust the ones that are up here if you don't agree, and then add two more. Okay. That's great, but I feel like there's also like getting something. Okay, so any of the dots that we already have, uh, start from there. So everything's going straight up that you've drawn. Okay. This is like with no win. No Okay. That's kind of fair. Yeah. Um, can you add one more that one right by the little blue edge that we have at the bottom right? Where would things be going here? Yeah. Kind of inward, mostly up at that point, so we're still pushing it in there and then towards the top. All right, any dot that we don't have, thank you. Any dot that we don't have, can you finish that up for us? See uh, like top three top. more. That one way out there. With the T? Yeah, there's one way over there. There is one way over there. Yeah. We're still doing that one. All right. So one outside of the flame on the left, uh, yeah. two uh, kind of inside in different points, and then this guy. Mm. Okay, so when we see that, is that laminar or turbulent behavior? Turbulent. That would be turbulent. Turbulent is when things are missing, right? When we get all that craziness. Were we seeing that for our flame yet? No, so not quite, quite yet. Okay, so it's going up. Is it going in any one direction? Are we going straight up? Should we with that? Kind of. Okay, so. Now let's get into uh, length of these arrows, right? What does it mean if it's longer or shorter? Faster. It's going faster. Longer means faster. Okay. So is that the fastest part of our flow right now? Okay. That's how we drew it, right? That would mean it is going faster. Right. Cool. So a little bit shorter. And let's do this last dot here. Mm -hmm. Oof. What's happening there? Mm. Just a little bit. Very small. How would that look? Very small arrow being pulled towards the flame, maybe. I'd say we're pulling more toward the base. I'm not. Toward the base. I'm not. Just we're doing that one dot. That's all we're worried about. David has a suggestion. I'd say small arrow being pulled towards the flame. Yeah. Okay, so if it's going down, why would that sink? Everything here is controlled by buoyancy, right? Right. Right, so if it's going down, that means we have some cooler than average air right here in right. a hot medium, and that heavier, cooler air is kind of sinking yeah. down. My guess is we kind of just have very, very mild current. It says, well, we're kind of being pulled in there, but we're barely moving, if anything, because we're kind of far away from the flame. Yeah. And here, nothing's happening, right? It's just, yeah. it's just like that. So we've drawn temperatures, we've drawn velocity profiles. They look very different because we're looking at different things. The very last thing I want you to draw is the a soot concentration profile. What would that be? Do soot concentration is that a vector or a scalar? Scalar, right? So I can just draw a set of axes for that, and then all right. So here's our axis for position. Here is going to be. You know what? Let's lower this down. Let's go and label. Oh, wait, no, that's a thing. I lied. Yeah, no, I think it's right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we're going to plot our soot volume fraction, and I want to see what's going on all the way down here. Use the cards. Use the cards. Yeah, use the cards. That would work. All right, so we have five different yeah. positions we're going to draw them out, right? Okay. And I want to see what that concentration looks like. So if I draw one set of lines, and let's say arbitrary, it looks like this. It's uh, terrible, right? Wherever that might be, I want to be able to plot on the same axis if I have more soot at a certain location. So let's say I've moved from one line to the other. Well, now I have more soot there. That kind of makes sense? Or if I have very little soot, then that never really goes up. So we're going to do profiles at each of these curves, or lines. So it's one, two, three, 
four, five. Does that make sense what we're going for? And we're doing all of that on this axis. Of course, so so anyone who hasn't been up yet, most of us have, I think, except Nick, right? Yeah, I haven't gone up either. So let's right. start up. Yeah, you can you can right, look cool, at the soot part. Yeah, yeah. All right, so where is soot being formed in our flame? Why is soot being formed? Let's start with that. Oh, wow. Right. So we're not just getting CO2 in water, but there's not quite enough oxygen for it. We get all this other stuff, which we saw as such. Cool. So we're back here. So choose your line first. One, two, three, or four, or five. Five. Okay. Cool. So we're walking all the way across that line. What would that look like as we're measuring so far? Concentration, so it's like. Well, we have our two axes, right? So here's oh, position. Right. As I move across, I'm moving across my line. Do I have any soot here? No. Uh, no. So, 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 so it's still nothing, right? Yeah. Still nothing, still nothing, still nothing. So, nothing. Much, so this should stay at zero, so right? Yeah. Then I hit my flame and something happens. You're going to draw what happens and then follow it along all the way through whatever's going on. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now, which is the sootiest part of our flame, let's say? So, this is way up there. Five. From, so, top to bottom, we have more soot happening up top, right? right? So, with respect to the line you just drew, at any other position, do you expect that they should be below that line? Right? One. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do you want to take one more and someone else will hop up and choose another one? Should I make that a little bit larger? Do whatever you want to do. It's all scaling off of this one. It's up to you there. Small little lines. Cool. So a whole bunch of soot there. Let's go ahead and draw line number three. Three? Yep. Let's draw one, and then I'll have someone else take the last two. It's like right here. I think those below that. So negative soot? That's a oh, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, what? At yes. best it says it's zero, right? Right. Maybe a tiny bit of something. Are you seeing? So how do we know that there's soot? What do we what do we get to see when there is soot back? It's all gonna come back to our, our radiation top there. Okay, cool. Yeah. And let's just label that. Five, three, one. Uh, five. So, okay. soot is forming where in, with respect to our candle flame? So let's say here's the edge of my flame, here's fuel, here's oxygen, so we're looking at like this zoomed in area, right? Where does soot form here? So I have be in that, middle. soot forms here, right? it's kind of what... Oh. Is soot forming out here? I thought soot was only like in the edges of it. Right, when we cut through the flame, we had those nice little rings, right? Yeah. We kind of just saw soot forming on the fuel rich side of the flame. Yeah. Is anything happening on here that we cut through before? Right, because now we draw the whole rest of it. There's oxygen. What was happening in here? It was hot, but it was hollow, and there's nothing there, right? So there's no real reaction, just a whole bunch of fuel vapor. So where would I actually see soot being formed? Just on the edges. On the edges here, where it's fuel rich and there's not enough oxygen, right? So are these quite right necessarily? I think that one might be because we're all the way up in there, right? So we're all close to the edge. But what would three change to? It should dip down. It might dip down, right? So here we got a whole bunch of soot forming there, and then again, like we saw with our temperature profile. There's no. It's. Do you make your M's like that? Sometimes. No. Really? Sort of. Sort of. I should I go to like doctor. Sure. sure. It's totally worth ten years staying here. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. That's all right. Let's go for it if you want it. Um, I'm just. I got five weeks to defend this all. Anyway. Um, should we draw one more profile here, and then we'll take a look at the actual measurements where they did this super carefully, and we'll compare what we drew versus what they measured. Let's do number four. Let's do number four. Who's doing number four? 
Okay, this is kind of hard. No volunteer support? That's pretty incredible. I just so go for it. No. Yeah. Kind of scared. I don't know what for would look like that. We can use it. I see that just being a little shorter. Maybe. Right, so we still got more sit up there, and you're of the opinion that yeah, it's, there's still a little option all the way up there that pretty much stays being formed anywhere in the flame right around. So you want to adjust it a little bit? Okay. Okay. All the way back down to three, somewhere in between. Oh, I'd say somewhere in between. Pieces between. Pieces here, yeah. That's the reasonable assumption, right? Pieces here. Pieces there. Really? All right, my phone is right there. No one heard of us. It's right there. Nothing. Hi <laughs> there. I agree. Oh. So much we got to Zero. Let's go and pick a. What is it? Uh, that's the race. Race. We're way behind, but that's okay because we're covering this well. Okay. So, we're going to go to our actual measurements. And they're kind of similar to what we did, right? All the way down at the bottom of the flame, pretty much nothing happening. As we go farther and we're running out of air, towards the edges we're seeing some soot. And all the way at the top, pretty close to what we had, a whole bunch of soot, and then it continues on all the way through. So we, we did a good job just from what we probed there and how we thought about this in, in terms of what's happening. Does that work? Yeah. So let's figure out why we start. We know why the soot is forming, right? Just not enough oxygen in there. Combustion reaction is kind of going, but it's not going all the way to completion. The wonderful color that we see there, so if you go back to our flame, when everything's burning perfectly to completion, we get this nice blue transparent flame. As we go farther up, we see that soot. The soot is what's actually allowing us to see this bright yellow. It's ridiculously hot. We're going to spend the lecture figuring out why. Really, really, really hot. Those little particles that happen to be there are so hot, they're just spontaneously radiating energy in all directions. And that's what we see as this bright light color. So if you crank up your oven and it's glowing red hot, those little tiny particles are moving really, really, really fast. And we see that nice color. That's why we see this. We're going to go into a little bit more. I think we're going to skip um, conduction and convection and just go straight to radiation, but that's OK. We're going to take one more look at a flame. I was taking pictures of like two weeks ago. This is a. Let's see, so on the left we have a piece of acrylic that we've ignited, and I was looking into understanding flame thickness, so wall material, flames on that surface, how close is that flame to the surface, uh, and understanding energy transfer. Color-wise, what are we seeing here? Blue paint orange. Blue paint orange, right? So why is there not, so there's blue at the bottom of our flame, it goes up to yellow by the top. Why does it say blue here? We have a wall that's burning just out in the open. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Put it together, we'll say one thing and then we'll move on. Super loud so we all hear it with confidence. Oh, man. Say anything. Right? So this is just ambient air, right? We have our flame drawing everything in. And as long as we're getting fresh air into that flame, we're still going to see that nice blue complete combustion. Yeah. So let's try to figure out or go behind some more math on why we're seeing these colors specifically. Before we get there, we need to understand what we mean by temperature and heat. So let's do maybe 10 minutes on this. We'll skip a bunch of stuff and then go straight to radiation. Do some lab stuff, do some more radiation, and then get a whole bunch of work to wrap it up. What is temperature? It's how warm warmer cold something is. All right, we can write that down. So it's going to add something to that. We have a consisting is cold. Movement of atoms, I like that. The speed of the speed of I really like that. The speed of the atoms. Movement of atoms. Can we add to that something about speed? How fast or slow that moving? How fast or slow which atoms are moving? Ooh, uh, Part of the atom. Yeah. 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 Ye
right. We will get into specifically electron movement. That's what gives us our okay. nice special colors that we see. Okay. Uh, and that yeah. has to do with spectral radiation. We're going to do all that. But all right, so we're okay with how warm or cold something is and how fast things are moving in there. Yeah. So what is heat? Pick up your phone because I get the text now, 10 minutes later. Uh, so what is heat? How warm is something? Exactly Rel what we wrote. Right? Relatively so heat is something else. Fast heat. Relatively uh, fast moving atoms. Heat Whoa. is fast moving atoms. Yeah. So if I throw this at you, right? That's heat. That's heat. I just I just had so heat much heat was produced. One. Right? So <laughs> that's it fails your definition, I'll <laughs> say, right? So Darn. Oh. Really? I actually got it. Do it that later. We'll do it that later. Oh. So what is heat? It's not I'm fast moving ID eye cards eye. going across the conference. <laughs> like, what is heat? I didn't think that was like oh man. It's I have to answer the question. <laughs> exactly. No. Good, good. Oh thanks. What is heat? All right. You threw cool. it. What is heat? I was trying to toss it back to you. You missed it. <laughs> oh. Um I got the question. <laughs> Uh, heat is a. You can bow out. It is a, a four-letter word that starts with an H and <laughs> ends with a T. Um. Anyone want to help him out? <laughs> no one. Uh, uh, radiant energy. Transfer. Transfer of energy. It's not always radiant okay. energy because there's other ways that it can transfer. So it has something to do with the transfer of energy. Can you take it. Which way is energy being transferred? How is it? Hot to cold. So transfer of energy, hot to cold. Take that. It's always hot. All right. And then some simple thought questions. True or false? If we do not stir liquid or gas, then they are not moving. False. False. Or inclusively false. All right. You have two identical beakers full of water, A and B. If twice as much heat is... If twice as much heat is transferred added into beaker A, which beaker will have the higher temperature? I got two beakers just kind of hanging out, A and B, and I'm going to add twice as much heat into A. Which one's going to be higher temperature? I have a feeling it's going to be B. But we have one B. We've got two half A's. Everyone else? Um, if I add more heat to something, do you expect it to well, have a well, higher temperature? Yes. But they're well, not the same thing. Heat but heat and temperature something. aren't the same yeah, thing. Not. So I'm so, adding more heat into B for A than I am into B. Which one will be at a higher temperature? Well, which, which one's kind of Which one starts uh, at a higher temperature? They're identical. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, that's... Right. A. Well, so it's mostly A, one B. I'm still All right. Which contains more thermal energy, an iceberg or a liter of hot water? Uh, iceberg. Yeah. <laughs> Does everyone agree with that? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Everyone? Yeah. Cool. So it's not just how hot something is, but maybe it's other things matter. Oh, right. <laughs> and and do cold water. objects contain thermal energy? Yes. 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 All right. Cool. So let's define temperature carefully. Temperature is oh, defined yes. carefully. Oh, as a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in whatever you're looking at. I think right? So if you increase the temperature of something, everything that exists that we know of, even though that's like 4% of the mass energy of the universe, right? But all that matter uh, is just these tiny little particles sorting around. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Does that be good? Are you taking notes? Yeah. I can send this all out after. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, you should totally. try to take notes on things that you want instead of, but you know, I don't know what. So I forget a lot. Anyway, so we have everything in right, our known that. universe made up of three <laughs> big elementary particles, which are what make up an atom. Yeah, let's start. Electrons, protons. Okay, so we have all those, and are they just kind of sitting, hanging still, or are they kind of moving around? They're moving around. That's three. Yeah, so I'm saying John, that counts. Did you say three or four? He said three. He said three. Okay. Uh, yeah, I thought you said four. four. I didn't think one. Yeah, like four. Tiny like particles four. are making four. us everything. Four. They're all moving around in tons of different ways, right? And the energy that they carry. So who's done physics? Just quick show of hands. Cool. So you have seen. No, Nick. Kinetic energy is equal to one half oh, F squared. Yeah. Right? 
So we have a whole bunch of tiny particles moving around real fast. They have some amount of mass. They're moving at certain speeds. So they have some energy to them, right? For everyone else, <laughs> this is true. But now you just know the math behind it. So tiny little particles that make everything, they're all moving really, really fast. As a measure of the energy that's contained inside of them, we define our temperature, right? So if I have my one particle, and I only allow it to move in the x direction, then that would be the average kinetic energy of that particle. So we recognize this Before from classical physics. Yeah. We relate it to temperature by Boltzmann constant. And we say the, we can get an average measure of the energy of that particle moving into this one dimension and, and call it temperature. And since we know that, at least in our world, things can move three dimensions, we just kind of crank it up and say, here's how we define temperature. It raises the average motion of all of our particles. All right? So let's get a feel for how our particles are moving. Is every single particle in this marker moving around at the same exact speed? No, it has the same average temperature, but some are moving faster than others. Right? So if I were to plot, let's say, velocity versus percent atoms molecules in marker at that velocity. What would that curve look like? Do I have every single one moving at the same velocity? Do I have a, just like, a, it's like a bell curve? I'd say it'd be a bell curve. All right, like so at the average. Uh, I don't have an eraser. All right, so we're looking for something like this. All right? What does that mean and why that? What does it mean? Let's start with that. And let's say this is the RMS, so the root mean squared velocity of the particles. So the average velocity of everything inside our marker. What is this shape telling us? It's telling us that if there's the same amount moving faster and slower, just like it it, Right? So most of the things that we have inside of whatever object are moving about that fast. Some of them are going a little faster, some of them are going a little slower. Even less than them are going even faster, and less than going, and it's just a few of them that are going ridiculously fast, and some are going ridiculously slow. Right? If I were to raise the temperature of this marker, how would that curve shift? We all agree. So it just kind of goes straight up to that. Everything's hotter. Everything's moving faster. Let's, for sake of argument, we look at this table right now, and we think, how quickly are these little molecules making up this table bouncing into each other? Every second, how many times do you think they bounce into each other? Millions. Billions. Billions. Ten to the nine? Trillions to the twelve? Go for it. I'm going to see it's even higher. You know, it's close. It's about ten to the thirteen. Every single second, that's how fast these things are bouncing into each other, fast, right? So we don't want to really count that. We define our temperature to track the average velocity of these particles. Let's do that. What do we have here? So really basic things. Hot water, you've got those particles moving much faster than in cold water. You add more energy into it. Right, we're adding more energy, so they're moving faster, that velocity goes up, that temperature goes up. So let's go into heat. Heat is defined as energy transfer between two objects. You don't really have heat. Uh, the amount of energy something has is defined by its internal energy, which has the symbol U, in case we're tracking symbols. Um, so I can't have X number of watts of heat. But I can say this object is really hot and it's sending this much heat to this other object. And we know that heat always goes from hot to cold. That never ever changes, right? How would it work the other way? I think that's right. I think we have ooh, different states of matter. Let's read this through here. But what are our three main known states of matter? And we're going to skip plasma. Okay. Solid liquid gas. Solid liquid gas. What's the difference between them? Uh, a solid is a, is a rigid structure. It's a rigid structure, sure. It has a normally like a complex, <coughs> or not exactly complex, but a specific shape that it repeats over and over. Some predefined shape. It can resist shear if you move, you're applying a force to it. And so, how do we go from solid to liquid? What do we generally do? We heat it up. We heat it up, right? So, what are we doing when we heat it up? Adding energy. We're adding energy. So, if we add energy, what happens to the little particles inside that solid? They start moving faster and faster, right? So all the interatomic forces that are holding those molecules together, well, they're doing their best to hold on, but now they're trying. These molecules are trying to go faster and faster and faster, and they can break free, and now we get our liquid, right? And so that liquid's still kind of confined to where it is. It's going to stay on the floor. They're somewhat held together. What happens is we start heating up our liquid more.
more and more and more. It goes along, it goes really faster. That's our definition of heat and temperature. And so if we throw enough energy into those molecules, what happens? They just can't break apart. Yeah. There's the forces trying to hold them together are overcome by just how fast they move and how quickly they fly. And we end up with our gas. Right? Temperature, energy, heat, we're going to keep that. So that's going to bring us to our three modes of heat transfer. Oh, man. I'm going to define them. Not, oh, man. But if, so I wanted to go through the actual physics on this one. And that makes the problem that everyone took a look at this one. You know it out? That's what that was. Yeah. Right? Well, so I, I wrote this up Saturday night. I'm like, yes, we can put this all together. But okay. we might put that on hold. For now, we're just going to learn the three different modes of heat transfer. All right. So we have conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is the easy one. What is that? Conduction. Right the transfer of the matter <coughs> motion of the medium. All right, so that's what we're defining it as. So let's give a colloquial definition and how we would normally see that. What would, uh, how would we relate to conduction? Like if you have a metal spoon in a pot of hot water, the, the handle of the spoon will get hot even though it's not Eventually it's going to get hot, right? So when you've got your iron skillet there and you leave it for a while, you may bake it, you come back 10 minutes later, you pick it up to move it, your fault is it's going to be really hot, right? <laughs> so convection, what is that one? Written there, but we'll have another colloquial definition from someone else. Okay, keep going. Which we might have to do. Collectively, anytime so anyone's offered an answer, we've done pretty good. A fluid can be a gas, not fluid just can a, be a liquid. liquid or a gas. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. So let's say I have fluid flow over a object. We're gonna have energy transfer from that, but why? So if it's a nice summer day. And we're hanging out there at what temperature are we on a summer day? 100. Really? Celsius. Whoa. Never ever use Fahrenheit. We're hanging we're out 32 30 30 30 degrees. 32 degrees. We're, we're now lying <laughs> on the ground because we died of hypothermia for some reason. <laughs> but we're at 32 degrees. Cool. All right. And let's make it a. Wait, are we doing Celsius or Celsius? Celsius. Celsius. Either way, you're dead at 32 degrees, <laughs> right? In I don't one case, I'm rigid. 20, 20, 30, 30, 30. Now, you're more dead. <laughs> Really? What is body temperature? Well, mine's like in, in Fahrenheit and Celsius. 97.6. Like 98.6, right? It's about 38 degrees in Celsius. Okay. You're dead. Let's not do that. But that's where we're at. It's 32 degrees. It's a nice hot summer day. And we're going to say, how hot does it get in summer? The worst of summer days. 40 degrees. 40 degrees. All right, so brutal day, right? And you're wafting over there. We got flies that are buzzing around, right? And now we get a nice breeze that's going over you. And by convection, right? Because that's bolt movement of fluid. temperature. Which way is convection going? Which way do we have that energy transfer from our summer breeze to our dead Jake? <laughs> Which, so heat transfer is a vector or a scalar? Mm. So heat transfer is, is, heat is transfer of energy from hot to cold, right? Oh, so that's if it's going from hot to cold, right? I need a direction. direction yeah. right. well, so okay. which way am I drawing the convective heat transfer from or to the air and to or from the body? Uh, in this hot system. to cold, so it's hot to cold, so it's going to the body. Right, right. so I can draw this huge convection. Does that work? So we have our two examples, heat flow through a solid, that's conduction, heat flow due to bulk motion of the fluid, that's going to be convection, and just for funsies, we're going to draw the equations with it. Uh, I did want to do a good walkthrough on this, I don't think we have time. That's okay, we'll get to it later. And let's make this convection. Cool. And that leaves us with radiation. What is this one? I'm still dead. What? Yeah, you don't have to answer me. You're dead. You don't get to eat, but you don't have to answer me. <laughs> can you kill it yourself? So can we think of examples of transmission of energy through space without the necessary presence of matter? Why this is important or why it isn't important? Yeah, why? Because of the sun. You're dead. But oh man! No, 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 I don't listen to ghosts. I don't. <laughs> Would you ignore a ghost if it talked to you? That is true. If that's what he was saying to me, <laughs> probably. 
It's like, I already okay. know that. <laughs> it's like ghost thing, like, look behind you. Look behind you. Am I sitting here right now? Maybe. Is it for my ID? Is that what I'm looking for? Because he's going to take care of that. <laughs> We're going to come back to radiation. Give me so two shit. examples of radiation heat transfer. The one that Jake suggested was heat transfer from the sun to keep us slowly nice and warm instead of frozen like he is down on the ground. One other example. Uh, radiation yeah, heat wait. transfer. <laughs> microwave. Ooh. Okay. There's subtlety there. You're heating things up, but you're not. Mm. Okay. Oh, so wait. microwave generates microwave radiation, which is a certain wavelength of, of electromagnetic energy, right? And that happens to be just at the right wavelength <coughs> to hit resonance with the water molecules in your food. So that when you're sending those beams of, of radiation through the food, it kind of makes those water molecules spin around and react with it. And all that extra motion heats it up. Uh, if you had some sort of microwave beam and sent it towards something, like a, a dish, let's say, I don't know what satellite this is supposed to look like, and you shot that out towards your object, I'd say that that would be radiation heat transfer. For a um, I was thinking simple, like a space heater getting really hot and just kind of oh, radiating off. off. <laughs> but that yeah. that works too. That actually, that's your diagram. What? That's what you're that's my yeah, yeah. Space yeah. heater would be more like this with coils in it. <laughs> yeah. And that's you know. I'm studying your microwave. That part. I've seen right. them look like satellites with like the things sticking on. We have a cone way. that we can look at just like that in lab. It's for a sound setup. Like that. So how about yeah. Ian sitting right there? Is he radiating any energy out? Yeah. Yes. Black. Right? He's just hot enough and he radiates energy out. Well done. Yeah. Wonderfully hot. Um, so we're going to say that black body radiation is going to look like this. So this is going to be the emissivity of an object. So basically of all the energy it could send out, uh, how much does it send out? So a black body will have emissivity equal to one. That is a signal. Oh, okay. I can't remember. All you know what's sad? I went to Greece this summer after a conference, and I was able to read menus because I recognized all the symbols from Greek. I didn't know what the words were, but I could slowly <laughs> sound it out. That's cool. Um, yeah. Kind of. No. Anyway, so emissivity goes from zero to one. So something that has zero emissivity, no matter how much energy it contains, you can't radiate any out. Something that's one that's perfectly black will send all of its energy out as radiation. This is just a constant. It's equal to 5.67 times 10 to the minus 11, depending on your units. It could be minus 10. Just a constant, the same way that these are constants, depending on your system. And then this relates to the surface temperature of something. The hotter it is, the more energy it radiates out. And things worth noting, this is linearly dependent on temperature, linear dependent on temperature to the fourth power. Right? So that changes things really weird. So that's like when we're upside down values. No, it's more like a not at all that. Uh, so let's say this is temperature and this is radiation. That would just be this. It just goes up indefinitely. Why would it come back down? So anything I plug into here, when would that get smaller? Now, if we did some some cubic function that also had plus co t to the third. Plus C1, T to the right? That general shape? Sure. But since we only have this one. Yeah. So let's kind of wrap it up there. I left a note saying that we might have to skip this. That's OK. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the difference between, we just wrote this guy down, right? Black body radiation and spectral radiation that uh, gives us distinct colors. So this curve kind of matters. What we're going to do is grab the food that came in, watch this video, and that's going to kind of relate the different kinds of radiations that we see. It's just going to show us where colors are coming from. We're going to bring that into our discussion oh, panel. Uh, so, if someone could uh, try to grab the yeah, pizza, yeah. if someone could grab my ID, yeah. if someone can help me grab drinks from the freezer and place some other stuff, that'd be good. Nice. Careful with, with no bad stuff. And I should probably shut that down too. There we go. Dude, you can't again that idea. He's gonna see you throwing again. Wow. He's gonna get so mad. Here. I'm just gonna leave it right in front of me. Stop it.
So Ethan's just gonna eat them all. Yeah. <laughs> One is <laughs> smaller. Oh, that's the brownie. And as long as you decide to use the camera, so I'm going to do the lion slower to the launch video. Oh, is it still recording? Oh, I, of course, of course it's still recording. It's gonna record the video. Yeah, that's like it. <laughs> no, no, educational purposes, no. Educational purposes. I mean, it's a joke. Well, I'm just trying to make it educational purposes. It wasn't working out too well. What's in here? It was really hard. Alright, alright. So we're back here. Uh, so that Friday I'm guessing that's going to burn the whole night for the scene in a nice way. It's like a few minutes off. Chicken is chicken. It's over there. I don't know. It's like chicken ish. Chicken ish? I don't know what it is. It's over there. What is it? Yeah, it's chicken. It's not. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. section of these distributions, and that's what basically changes the color, is the relationship of the, the blue end to the red end of the spectrum for the eyes is what gives us the perception of color. So we're seeing not stars at different colors, but we're seeing stars at different temperatures. Right. So when you go out and look at the night sky, you see a red star over there, you see a cool star. You look over there, you see a blue star, you see a very hot star. So the good thing about black bodies is that once, once we understand them, they're very simple. That this curve is in sequence star, you know, we can understand it very well. You can figure out the temperature of the star, and that's it. And so, everything else we know about these stars comes from when they're not like that. This is astrophysics that is the most basic. The deviation is away from the overall reaction. The light that is emitted in the core of the star takes 50,000 years to work its way up. And then, when it finally reaches a certain point in the photosphere, the material in the star is thin enough. But that photon makes one final leap out to our eyes. It, it actually it's opaque. The star is opaque. So, okay. yeah, it's ionized. It's a plasma. It's like so hot that the electrons and photons are separated. And photons can get scattered off of these things. So it, you know, it might get scattered off like this, and then it might need another one. You need to get scattered off some more, go in opposite directions for a little bit. So you have a random walk. It keeps hitting things. Yeah. The sunlight you're feeling was created by nuclear reactions that happened way later. This is important, right? Because if, that, if these photons weren't bouncing off all of the material in the star, how the hell would it keep the star from collapsing? So, yeah, very collapsing. That's what's yeah. doing the work. This atmosphere that causes the little deviation is so yeah. a black body. Because the photons have to make their last journey yeah. to that. And it's actually 
end of this 50,000 year journey that the photon. It's a light pole. Sometimes it's a light pole. It's a discrete wave. And these light poles are related to the transition energies of the electrons in the atoms and molecules that are in the star's atmosphere. So you have, in the center of your atom, your nucleus, the protons and neutrons just hanging out and going around and you have electrons. You can imagine them buzzing around on the outside. Well, you're, by the way, it's very discrete energy. And so when a photon comes through, it might hit this electron, if possible. And if it has just the right energy to kick it up to this level, it will do that. Uh, otherwise, it'll pass right back. And so, all the light that comes through on this side, everything comes in. On this side, almost everything comes out. Everything except a couple spots here, holes, which are exactly the energy to move from here to here, which are absorbed away. And the distribution of those lines, their depths, and other properties give you tons of fundamental information about the star. We can tell you by a detailed study of the exact positions of the little divots. We can tell you the amount of iron, the amount of sodium, the amount of potassium, the amount of, in some stars, the amount of titanium oxide or carbon monoxide that's in the stars' atmosphere. This is how we can tell what elements are in the cosmos because each element has its little electronic fingerprint. So you can define a uniquely by my DNA, and you can define a star uniquely by its combination of chemical temperature and age. And just like you can sequence my DNA and tell me who I am, what color my eyes are, and what texture my hair is, you can read the spectrum of a star and completely characterize it. I can tell you everything about the star, what it's made out of, how massive it is, how long it's going to live, and if it has a family of planets. The fact that we understand these lines and can do work with them is what took astronomy from being counting and figuring out people's horoscopes into legitimate science, to where you can make predictions test them. It's hard to conceive that really these little atoms in our bodies were actually forged together because of the intense pressures inside of stars. They're hundreds, thousands of light years away. Yeah, the right. universe started as hydrogen. This is all there is in the universe. Yeah. Right. Hydrogen, helium, right. and metal. Right. Tiny. And the yeah. metals come from fusion going on stars turning these really light elements into heavier elements over time. So when the star is done fusing all of the hydrogen and helium into heavier stuff, it some of them explode from transplant energy range, and then they cough that newly formed heavy element out into space where it gets mixed up with other interstellar stuff. And then so new stars form the, the stuff that the old stars just coughed up, so then you get stars that have a little bit of heavier elements in them. And then over time you get more and more stars that have and that if you have iron and carbon and all these other metals in the sun medium, planets can form out of it. The evolution of the universe. Yeah, I have a titanium ring. This yeah. ring would be here if it weren't for the depths of millions of stars. Okay. I made a carbon. Yeah. I wouldn't be here. So we're like literally made out of sun. Yeah. Now we can look up at stars and we have a physical understanding of what we're seeing. And so one of the biggest open questions in astronomy today is the almost universal mass distribution that we observe for stars throughout the entire galaxy. So the number of stars as a function of mass can be well approximated by the mass of the star raised to the minus 2.35 power. Why does it look like that? Well, it's basically nature's way of waving a flag and saying, check it out. You can decode this rule and you'll understand something profound about where we came from. How it all happened. We come from stars, right? This is us. And we're broadening that context. And it all starts with getting people interested in it from the get go. Taking your child outside, looking up at the stars, and they might ask you, why does that star rise? What is it made out of? Where does it come from? So you can make a physical equation to tell them to solve it. So you can draw a physical equation. Wow. Um, 